I would always say, if you're going to use your own cash, you might as well invest in your people. We're spending an awful lot of time quoting when really what we want to be doing is more deals. Deciding which solution you want, you're happy with it. Now I'm going to buy. You want that to be really quick. Absolutely really quick. Great information. Take 10 seconds to produce. There's a laws passed to bring this software out so people could access that information more quickly and make quicker decisions. Yet the majority of the banks won't accept that information from banking. I was slightly addicted to TikTok recently. <laughs> and... Hello and welcome to Tech for Finance, where we help finance professionals leverage technology to level up their lives. I'm your host, Adam Shilton, and in this episode, we're going to be chatting with Rob Partridge, who is Managing Director of Synergy Partner Finance. Rob has over 20 years experience in the financial service space and now works with businesses of all shapes and sizes to spread large capex projects into affordable monthly payments. Thanks for joining me today, Rob. Thank you. Perfect. So do you want to give a, a little bit of background on Synergy? I know, is it coming up, is it coming up to five years now that you've been with Synergy? So do you just want to tell us a bit of your story and how it all came about? Yeah, sure. So, so Synergy actually was a sub-brand of another company that I, I started nearly eight years ago called Kingston Capital Finance. And Kingston Capital and Synergy are actually merged as businesses early this year. But like I say, Synergy was a sub-brand of Kingston Capital for, for some time until it became absolute trading business probably five years ago. And Synergy really is what we, we focus on as sales aid finance in the uh, B2B uh, world. So example of that is that we would partner up with, with IT and tech companies, provide point of sale finance solutions to help customers afford those solutions, also help those companies close uh, transactions more quickly and get them through the systems more quickly. Very good. Appreciate the background there. And how, how have you seen things change recently? I know I, I kind of probed you on this a little bit in our, in our last conversation, but of course, you know, we, we've come out of a, a global pandemic. We're now apparently running headlong into a recession, even though a lot of businesses that I've spoken to seem to think that things are, are still going all right. So how do you see things shifting? And are you sort of fluxing the way that you're approaching business at the moment with that, with that sort of thing in mind? Yeah, well, it's interesting because this has been our best year up until this point, but we have certainly seen a major slowdown in transactions at this, this past sort of four or five weeks. And we suspect it will continue that way. I mean, I, it's one of those things I hate talking about recession. It's, it's one of those fulfilling prophecies, isn't it? Basically, if we all talk about it, it will happen. But I mean, the writing is on the wall and we've been here before. I've certainly been here before. And all I can do is look back at my, my experience of those times. In fact, in 2007, 2008, I'd started working for a brokerage who specialized in funding IT and tech projects. And then of course the bubble burst and, and, and we hit recession. Now it feels very similar to those times in the sense of we saw a gradual slowdown in opportunities and people sort of running around the hair on fire, not too sure what to do, sort of rabbit in headlights in, in a scenario whereby they would just sit tight and decide that, you know what, we weren't making decisions yet because let's just see what happened. And, and I get that feeling now. In fact, we've already spoken to customers who are saying, we'll put it off to the new year. We want to see what's going on in the market. And so we're prepared, you know, and uh, I've already warned my em employees at that, but at the same time, it doesn't mean that we're going to stop trying, you know, we're still out there supporting our introducers, our customers, and still having those conversations. If anything, when these things happen, I find that you're more, if you're front and center and speaking to your customers and, and, and introducers more often, knowing that they care and you're there to support them when something does happen, you're going to stick in their mind. It's as simple as that. Mm -hmm. So I think we're going to see maybe maybe up until February next year, where it, there is a, a, a slowdown. I mean, recession probably won't actually be called until probably early part of next year anyway, because it's always a little bit behind. It's probably sort of three or four months behind anyway, when they can actually say it's officially in a recession. So I think, you know, it comes as no shock to anyone that that will happen. And I think of course, what will happen is that companies with the society, you know, we, we can't leave off investing in our businesses. We need to crack on, we need to invest and if that means we need to borrow money to do so, then we will. 
So it's, I don't believe it's any different really from what we've experienced before. We'll soon find out. But what we do know is that there's a lot of things happening at this point in time that have never happened before, you know, with the energy crisis and the war and various other things that are going on in the world that are, are affecting people. You know, it's funny how we're not even talking about Brexit anymore, are we? You know, it's almost like <laughs> disappeared that thought, hasn't it? Uh, but it, it seems that we've just had all these things flying at us and we just need to cope with them and get on. And we will do. But unfortunately, we'll, I think we've all seen some businesses that will hit the wall. We already are seeing some businesses do that who struggled through COVID, who mm. haven't. And, you know, I'm beginning that, that slippery slope towards insolvency. So it's going to happen. But we just need to make sure that we're around there to, to, to try and help those customers who are running their businesses well. They have got some good ideas who are maybe using the opportunity of this, this downturn or potential recession and say, well, actually, there's an opportunity and we can take advantage of it. Mm -hmm. We need someone like, like ourselves to help them to do that. So, I, you know, I think it's just a matter of rolling with the punches, isn't it? Simple. Absolutely. Yeah. And it, it does make me gig because I often wonder, you know, what else can they throw at us, right? And, and I don't know who they is, you know, you know, but yeah, it, it is relentless. It's, it's unrelenting, isn't it? You know, it's, it's, it's absolutely obscene. I mean, when you take the, the structure of a, of a tech project though, the, there's quite a lot as part of that. So, you, you know, you may have a certain amount of licensing, certain amount of support, and then you've got initial ser services, you know, and, and we're talking, you know, some pretty big differences, you know, as little as you know, 20, 30 K worth of setup for some smaller solutions and then maybe six, seven figures for some larger solutions. But surely if, if your business is at a point where it recognizes the transformation and change is necessary, then finance has got to be a way to de-risk things slightly, hasn't it? Because immediately if you've not got a big lump sum coming out of the bank, coming out of the bank, then that, you know, whether it's easing cash flow or so on and so forth. That gives you more opportunity to use money for other purposes, I guess. Yeah, sure. I mean, I'm obviously quite biased at the end of the day. <laughs> <laughs> like peddling money to people, okay. but, but fundamentally, I think it, I always find it interesting because there are scenarios where companies do have large amounts of cash set in their bank account. Now, if that's the case, it always has been the case. And I would say, yeah, use it and invest in it. If not, you know, most companies in a fortunate position now the situation is as well though there's a lot of companies out there well-known companies who will use finance as well even though they have got huge amounts of cash in their bank because they rather use their cash on other things that are going to give them a return on, on on their money so a good example of that for instance you know you know i will always say if you're going to use your own cash you might as well invest in your people so train them new staff you know, also look about marketing, market yourself better, you know, really invest in the things that you know that could potentially give you a return in your business. Now, I'm not saying that investing in an IT project won't give you a return because it will, it certainly will. What it does do sometimes is you look at that cash that you're investing in there and you think, well, the actual asset, if you want to call it an asset, let's say it's an ERP project of some sort. Physically, as an asset, it's not really worth anything. I mean, God forbid, you know, we, we, we gave some funds to a customer who, who invested in the IRP project and, you know, they went bump overnight. There, there's nothing to claw back. There's no asset there to, to return your, your cash on. However, the, the functionality of the software that, that is, it's, it's far stretchy within a business can really add value overall, you know, and really sort of lay the foundation for that business to take themselves to the next stage. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, it's, it's an interesting one, but when it comes to sort of talking about the, in the makeup of a transaction nowadays, more and more software projects, the licenses, it's just a, a minute part of the transaction. As you full well know, you know, it's a lot of consultancy. There's a lot of maybe training and support and maybe bespoke work or whatever it may be. So when you look at the project as a whole, it's more about what's that vendor or that software solutions actually providing that company going forward the support and everything else mm -hmm. so we, we look upon those projects as fundamental to those to the uh, the running of the business now it's interesting because i have a lot of conversations with my friends who work in asset finance who 
there's two types of asset clients, by the way, is hard assets and soft assets. Mm. Hard assets being your vehicles and vessels and soft assets being sort of more IT and office equipment. And a lot of my friends that work in hard asset think I'm absolutely nuts that we, we, that we would invest in anything like a soft asset because you can't get your money back on it. All that kind yeah. of stuff. Well, I would argue that it's, it's the foundation now of most businesses. It really is. I mean, God forbid, you know, a company got into to financial difficulties and they were hauliers that say they could probably get rid of a few vehicles to save the day and continue mm -hmm. trading. Whereas mm -hmm. if you took their IT away from them tomorrow, they can't trade. It's as simple mm -hmm. as that. So yes. when you look at it in that way, I would argue that a soft asset, especially uh, an ERP project or a big IT infrastructure project is absolutely fundamental for any company to even operate alone, you know, provide what their the solution may be. So it's, it's, it's something that we, that I'm really keen on. We, I've been doing it for 20 years now and sort of investing in, in, in IT projects is something that really sort of ticks my boxes. But uh, of course, there's a lot of subscription solutions nowadays as well. So funding doesn't always come into it. In that case, when your licenses are being hosted and, and subscribed to, there still tends to be some consultancy and support and, you know, costs to those projects, which we can also fund them. And we do have a specialist product, which is called a technology loan, which mm. enables us to do that for customers. Mm. And it's, and it hasn't occurred to me as somebody who's been doing this for donkey years now, but you often forget when you talk about tax that it doesn't always apply to the soft stuff. Yeah. But, but yeah. I mean, we live in the cloud now, right? So people start talking about technology. It's an app on your phone or it's, it's filling the gap. Right? But if you're a wholesale distributor to the warehouse, you need a terminal, you need a handheld device. You know, if you're a, a retailer that got physical stores, you need an EPOS system, you need tools, you need hardware. You know, and, and even if you're a professional service organization, you know, you've got consultants out on the road, you know, re real estate surveys, all of that sort of thing. It's all, it's all physical kit, isn't it? Mm. I learned the servers that you might need to, to host it. Obviously I appreciate we're not talking true cloud in those instances, but you might have server infrastructure that you need to invest in as well. It seems to get bigger and bigger, the more elements of a project you think about, right? And, and it hadn't occurred to me until we, we discussed it recently that it's still classed as technology and it could still potentially be funded. So, so what we were talking about there in terms of you've got your licensing support and your consultancy, that's further extended by then saying, right, well, actually, you know, if we are running a warehouse, we need three terminals and 10 handheld devices, which all have a value as well. So, so you go from, you know, 50 K software project, you know, to a you know, 75, 80 K software and infrastructure projects. So it's, it's easy to see how that initial investment escalates. So it may become more attractive for people to, to spread that into a manageable amount. Cause I know exactly how much is going to go out the door without seeing that massive chunk go out, you know, early doors, I guess. Yeah. And also as well, I mean, th these things tend to have a short life, don't they? And if the you know, equipment that's being used every day, I don't know, maybe some rugged handhelds or whatever it may be that could get beat up, could get dropped, all that kind of stuff. But the line span of these, these type of kids is usually short, you know, so yeah. between three and five years old. So, you know, we tend to be funding IT over those short period of time because we'd like to think, you know, at the end of that, you know, period, they're going to look to upgrade it and get onto something new or better or something that's just, a, you know, not been beaten up. So, and it's always about that. It's always about using IT and infrastructure in business and replacing it as and when it needs be. If you think about it from a, from a business owner's point of view, if you have 80 grand in the bank, like you just gave that example, why would you invest in something that has such a short period of, of life and which you know, really that you can't get a return on investment? It's not like a vehicle. It's not like you go and buy yourself an 80,000 pound HGV and you know that mm. maybe in five years time, you can sell it and maybe get a grand back. It's, mm. it's not happening, is it? So you might as well use the lenders or some kind of lenders money to invest in your IT infrastructure and the other 80,000 pounds, you know, reinvest it in your people, you know, like I say, or train them, get new employees in. Maybe you can get some sales staff in who's going to increase your bottom line or whatever it may be. So use the money in, in a, a more advantageous way, I would say. Thanks, Rob. And that, that kind of brings me on to 
the, the, the second set of questions, I guess, that I, I have for you, which relates to, to your own digital transformation at Synergy. So, so you, you mentioned sales and marketing there. And obviously as an organization, you try and stay as close to your customers as possible. That's self evident And you now give them the tools that they need to make your job easier. You know, it, it makes our lives easier. It makes your lives easier. So you have a portal and enables your customers to go on and generate their own quotes and do their own you know, credit and risk assessment online. So where, where did that idea, I mean, it seems common sense right now. Oh, it makes sense. Yeah. Why, why didn't we have a portal before? But, but take me through that thought process. Why, why you decided to embark on a project like Crick? customer portal, what you've seen as a result of it, and maybe some of the challenges that you met along the way. Yeah, sure. It seems still a bit strange now that we're having that conversation because I would like to think that in this day and age, uh, there, we'd have many competitors, but we just don't, which I find odd. Oh, don't get me wrong. There's plenty of lenders out there that have their own platforms. Of course, what we are is we're not only a lender, but we're also a broker. Uh, and the fact that we have access to over a hundred lenders in the UK. So really what we were trying to do is create a platform that gives our introducers, companies like yourselves, opportunity to access those lenders, effectively creating your own product for your customer, you know, mm -hmm. bespoke to them. Now that sounds quite simple and it's been done in various other industries, the consumer market for many, many years, but in the B2B asset finance market, it's just not there. Now it could be because it's costly to do so. It could be the fact people can't be bothered to sit down and figure out how, how it could actually happen. I'm not sure. I mean, I, I sort of had the idea maybe 10 years ago when I was working somewhere else and I was forever picking up the phone and doing quotes and sending those quotes out to suppliers and vendors, which was great because you obviously had that conversation. You understood the project that was potentially going on, but we found that sort of 80% of those quotes just weren't happening. So. Uh, we're spending an awful lot of time quoting when really what we want to do is more deals. So rather than focus on doing the do, I wanted to focus on actually adding value to our introducers. So exactly. let's see if we can create a build a portal where they can go on, like you mentioned, formulate your own finance quote to support your sale, credit check your customer as well. And then if they do want to proceed, then you can just click on a button that comes through to us. And then you can track the deal from start to finish and finish being cash in your bank account. And we'll handle everything at the transaction in the background you can check and follow and everything else as it goes along. Now, when I say about supporting our introducers more, we're trying to uh, add value in the sense of, right, what financial products are there out there? I mean, most people have come across leasing in the last 30, 30 40 years. It's, 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 it's well known. Technology loan products aren't very well known. Operational lease products aren't, aren't well known tax and how tax works, how it benefits the customer only in their business, but also using finance and how that can use to be leveraged in their business. Education to our, our introducers as well is sort of providing sort of online videos, tutorials, actually doing some online video uh, tuition lessons as well. I'm going to see them and just explain to them how you can benefit and, uh, by using point of sale finance solution and when to offer you know, as well, because I think in, in sales, some people get very scared about asking how they're going to pay for it and when they're going to ask them how they're going to pay for it. They do an awful lot of work and then they get to the stage where they say, well, this is going to, what's going to cost, how are you going to pay for it? And they find that they can't afford it or, you know, unfortunately their credit's not so great, so they can't even secure clients for it. So it's all about educating the salesperson about ask it early, offer it early. And then you've kept all your options open. That's all it's about is keeping your options open. Mm -hmm. So I want, so the, the whole point was, is that I wanted to create a portal so people could do some of that work for me. Mm -hmm. I'm a typical lady sales guy. <laughs> <laughs> but also I wanted to add some value out there and I wanted to provide a product that I could see wasn't out there, which mm -hmm. to me was bizarre, you know, and I thought, well, hold on, it's not out there. Let's, let's give it a go and see what it is. Now I'm not saying there isn't a competitor out there. I'm not aware of one, certainly. We won three awards for innovation in, from our, the National Association of Commercial Finance Brokers. So mm. to think that we've won that award would suggest to me that we're probably the, the only one out there. Of course, I think we've asked it a bit of a, a, a well-kept secret because we still need to get make people aware that we're out there and that's what we're offering. Mm. So uh, 
Yeah, it's, it's an interesting product that we've put out there. We're constantly working on it. It's, it's integrated with, with Credit Safe and Zero, Companies House, and DocuSign and various other integrations to make the, to make the transaction real swift. So yeah. in, in in practice, transactions often take maybe a few weeks. But we could, and we have done a couple within a day where we've had it come in in the morning where the customer's already had a, a quote probably from the, 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 a couple of days before, but they've said, yes, I want to go ahead with that. We've looked, we've, we credit checked them. We've had to have some financial information from the customer, maybe some accounts, bank statements, that kind of stuff, which they've uploaded to our portal. We've assessed, we've underwritten it either with our, uh, our own funds or with uh, one of our lenders. The finance is approved. Documents go out for, for e-sign, they sign them back in and the uh, vendor uploads their invoice and we package the bill up and send it for payment and payment within 24 hours. So can, it can be very, very quick. If I'm honest, I think it should be quicker. I think our world is a little bit too slow, but unfortunately there is a lot of fraud, certainly nowadays compared to, to most recent times, but um, there's a lot of fraud in, in our industry. So the lenders are very sort of keen to, to do a lot of background checks and that can obviously take time. I still think we can system and process what we do much more quickly. I just think it's the will and desire whether the banks want to actually invest in it. A lot of the lenders in our financial world, have very big names above their heads, yet the department that we're dealing with might only have 10 employees We're doing many, many millions a year. So it, it's usually about a number of people as well, trying to get involved in the transaction to slow us down. So, yeah, I think, you know, we, we, we do have issues that get me wrong. So um, it has been a bumpy road. It has been, it can be very slow. You know, we've never designed the software before, you know, we sat down and thought, what do we want it to do? And we sat down and wrote a, a plan and which we thought was a, a detailed plan, but we, we realized that it's not very detailed at all because <laughs> we have to, I think like a developer. If we're telling the developer, right, we want to put this information here and it spits out the information at the other end, the developer's like, well, how does it go for those processes to get to that bit? And we're like, I don't really know. So uh, you're the, yeah, <laughs> <just, laughs> <you're not. laughs> exactly, exactly. But I guess in a way, what it has taught me is to system and process absolutely everything. And I'm quite keen on the system and process. I mean, my, my staff always take the mick out of me because of it. But I, I love sitting down and figuring out every single process and the ifs, buts, and maybes that go along. And I think we did a lot of that. And then we gave it to the to developers. And of course, it was never 100 percent perfect. And they would always say, Well, what happens if this happened? And we thought, well, we never even thought about that. So and of course there's some things they would have missed as well. And you know, sometimes the, the, the software doesn't work quite the way we want it to work and we need to get changes. But and of course as well, because it's our our unique selling point keen to develop it more and so we've got these great ideas about how far we can take it our developers are are still way behind where we want to be so mm. it's almost you created a beast and you're struggling to control this beast you really are and of course the new things come on the market and you think i'd be great if we could do that you know like um, they're doing a lot of id checks now with uh, over the camera and so forth and on your phone that was yeah, yeah. a couple of your KYC banks love a KYC, which stands for know your customer. Yeah. Uh, so if we could do that on the phone, how can we integrate that with the portal? Would that stop them slowing down KYCs at payout stage? If we did it for them, could we quicken it up? And yeah, yeah. you know, there's, there's so much going on that we're, we're, we're keen to do, but it's just takes time to develop it. Really fast. Yeah. No. And, and yeah, I think, I think software projects, whether they're a bespoke portal or an ERP system or what have you, that. They're never to yeah. be underestimated because it involves business change. You know, m multiple people with multiple views. You know, we want it to work this way. We want it to work this way. They've got the supplier. Oh, well, it can only work that way because we can only do it in this way and so on and so forth. So yeah, mm -hmm. I totally appreciate how they do turn into to beasts, especially, and, and I suppose it depends who you're speaking to and what your experience was, but projects tend to grow legs so so what you ex when you sign a contract to say this is what we want at the end of it is very rarely the same as what you end up at the, the back end of the process especially when it comes down to custom development so you know 
I don't know whether the portal was in line with your expectation or whether it came out better or whether it was, you, you know what I mean? But I'd, I'd be curious to know how different the result was to the spec that you gave them originally. Yeah, it was interesting because I had, I had my background before finance is graphic design. Okay. I'm a visual person. So I'd even done some mock-ups of what I wanted it to look like and all this kind of stuff, which was a total waste of my time, which had told me not to <laughs> Because they just ignored it all, or it just couldn't look that way. I don't know. I never know, to be fair. Yeah. So they came back with what they thought it should look like. And so I just dealt with it and thought, okay, we can run with that. It's not a problem. I mean, really, at the end of the day, it's about data and it's about, does it visually make sense and does it look good? I'm, I'm a bit more of it, does it look good? Mm. but then anyone else's uh, as functionality is at the end of the day. So yeah, th these things do grow legs and d do provide problems. Also, you know, developers actually come up with some great things, you know, like the DocuSign, which yeah. I said, look, we need our documents DocuSign. If we can try and keep it in, within our portal, that'd be amazing. So they, they've managed to write it whereby you can call the customer on the screen comes up with three or four security questions. If they pass those security questions, we hit a button whereby a code goes to their mobile phone. They can then click that, uh, open the email, which they received with the e-documents, mm -hmm. put the code in to make sure that that's totally secure. And then when they sign the documents, it's going via DocuSign, collecting all the right information and then coming back into our portal and depositing that document within our portal. Which I was surprised, I didn't think that was even possible thought we'd have to go and collect it from DocuSign ourselves, put it, drag it into our portal, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But no, they, they'd managed to enable us to sort of package up a deal because it's, it's all various elements to, to a deal, of course, you know, we might need a copy of customer facing proposal from, from the vendor. We will need the invoice. We we'll need the, obviously the, our, our documents, various other bits and bobs as well that, that formulate the finance documents. But, and it managed, they managed to get it all in one package. And so really all we have to do to send it up for payment is click a little box and it goes. And the, the, it's either our, our internal team who are paying it out or a bank and they're just opening up documents there. Thank you very much. Check. Yeah. Fine. Bang. Paid out. So there's some things they've done up, above and beyond what mm -hmm. I expected, which is great. But there's some things that I'm asking them to do, which, um, still bamboozling them. Maybe it's sometimes I find it's the platform that building it on. Sometimes yeah, yeah. it has limitations, which I wasn't aware of, you know, so yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's, and it's interesting that, uh, I mean, yeah, the, the, the DocuSign piece is, is a great one. Lot, lots of systems now, you know, whether it's like a HubSpot serum, when you're sending out a quote, you know, they've, they've got some sort of e-sign. Which... And the aim there is obviously get the signature on the contract as soon as possible. The, the, the path of least resistance, right? You know, we don't want people to have to think, we just want them to take this action. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm having more and more conversations now with, with the speed of information you, you often find, especially in highly competitive businesses, that your speed of reaction is, is sometimes gives you a competitive edge. And, and I'm sure it's the yeah. same with you. So, so with your portal, you are able to receive and manage quotations and be able to place orders quicker. So, so in theory, as you scale, volume shouldn't be an issue because you've now got a mechanism in place that says, you know, there's yeah. no ceiling. We, we can deal with as much as possible, but there, there are crossovers, you know, when you, when you look at retailers, for example, you know, EDI interfaces with the, with the supermarkets, you know, that that's all live information flowing. I've been asked more and more now about supplier onboarding, you know, so, yeah. some of the complexities in large companies when they're just requesting information from suppliers is massive. If you yeah. just have a portal where supplier can manage their own onboarding, you know, yeah. load their own documentation. And I always think about, and it's not a business example, it's a, it's a personal example. So this house that I'm sitting in now, we've only been here since December last year. So not, not even quite a year that we've been here yet. And it, it was a new build and a buyer pulled out. So they said, oh, you can have it at a great price if you can complete within 30 days. So I everybody does, I point through, through all of the solicitors saying, uh, can you help me? Because the solicitor I was using saying, you've got no chance. We don't need new builds and we won't do it in 30 days. And I was like, oh, mm -hmm. fabulous. Thank you. I phoned, phoned around and, and literally every local solicitor, you know, 
every traditional solicitor essentially said, we can't do it. We're not resourced for it. You're living in a dream world. Yeah. So I phoned the, uh, basically phoned the salesperson that sold me this house. And I said, I'm really struggling. Can you recommend a solicitor that can meet your, cause it was in, within his interest, right? He needed to sell yeah, it. Sure. Uh, hey, so I so said, can, can you think of anybody? He said, let, let me speak to the, the, the conveyancing team. So they've all got internal, well, a lot of them got internal conveyancing teams now. And he came back with the details of, and, and I can't remember who they were. If, if I find the details, I'll put them in the show notes after the fact. He said, these are the quickest guys we've ever used. I think mainly down to the fact they'd used them quite a lot before and there was potentially a partnership and a bit of a kickback there just reading right. between the lines I don't know whether that's a fact or not but they said it was all done through an online portal and I said right and he said but if you think about it it makes so much sense because the biggest delay when you're going through a sale is documentation backwards and forwards yeah. Yeah. it's the physical paper trail you know the solicitor will do this document it'll take a couple of days you sign it and you send it back and it's another couple of days it makes yeah. so much sense when you've got everything in place. Yeah. But it's so difficult to get a view of what that future could look like until, until you're actually doing it. You see what I mean? So we complete within three days. It was all done within the portal. Worked fabulously. I think I spoke to a human being maybe once or twice. And, and it was at the right point where you actually want to speak to a human, you know, to give you the yeah. warm, fuzzy feeling. Oh yeah, this is our yeah. process. This, this is how we do it. Aside that was all done in the portal yeah. and, and I'm, I'm a bit of an introvert, you know, I can be an extrovert, push myself really hard, but it saps my energies. Anything in my personal life that limits the interaction with people, as yeah. much as I'm, you know, people might, might criticize me for saying is, is, is a plus, right? Because we're bombarded with so much information nowadays, you know, can do without another conversation or can do without filling out another document. So if everything is packaged yeah. into a nice little product with a, with a nice little bow that makes it as easy as possible, there's a big business case for that, I think. Absolutely. Yeah. Here ends my little story. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, that, to be fair, that's a good story. And, uh, you know, that, that's the road that I'm on. Of course, what we're fighting a lot of the time is that the, you know, the, it's the traditional infrastructure that we have. And the fact is that we want to change things, yet the, the people that you're dealing with at the other end either don't want to change or can't change because there are, you know, for instance, there might be a mighty boat in, in the sea, which takes forever to turn, you know, and, and it's difficult to convince some people uh, that, you know, we can get to here very quickly. They're saying, well, there's this red tape and this red tape and whatever. And that, and that's becomes a frustration. So I've hit a lot of those walls. I really have. One, one really interesting wall up hit quite a lot is, is open banking. Now open banking came out, what, six, maybe five, six years ago, everyone was you know, raving about it. And we do have some open banking software, which we just asked for the customer to put their bank details in, which is well, you know, the, the, the app on their phone might be a Barclays app, whatever it may be, just to make yeah. sure it's secure. And then that software will grab one year's worth of transactions from that bank account. And take all that data and it will provide many pretty beautiful looking graphs. It says exactly, you know, the out debt they've got outstanding with, you know, other financiers, who their, you know, the biggest payer is, who is their worst payer, all this kind of stuff. Great information. Take 10 seconds to produce. Now, you know, there was a laws passed to bring this software out so people could access that information more quickly and make quicker decisions. Yet the majority of the banks won't accept the information from open banking you still ask for uh, was a bank statement and uh, it's just frustrating because we've got some of the technology out there the banks won't accept it now we don't know whether that's red tape we don't know whether it's because they haven't got their ducks in a row to be able to okay it or just because it's pig-headed and they're, they're, they're used to their old-fashioned way we're never going to get the answer because you know there's I, I'm never going to speak to the person who, who can answer that question. So it is frustrating from that point of view, but what we're trying to achieve is, is quicker transaction. Now I know that that can be open to fraud if done the right way. You can cover off all these KYCs, these anti-mail laundering checks, everything else. You can do it really quickly. And of course we're in another day and age now as consumers, where we want something, we want it now and we mm. can buy it now. There's a lot of tools out there for, to, for us to buy it now. 
Now, I'm not saying that you would do that with an SAP project or ERP project or any kind of IT infrastructure. You, you wouldn't just see it and buy it the same day. I get mm -hmm. that. But it's when you've made the decision to buy, you know, if you've made a decision to buy, you've been through the process of, you know, looking at all these suppliers you can provide a solution you want, deciding which solution you want, you're happy with it. Now I'm going to buy. You want that bit to be really quick, absolutely mm -hmm. really quick. Not, not just from the customer's perspective, but also from the, from the vendor's perspective. They want to get that deal opportunity out of the market. They don't mm -hmm. want any of their competitors sniffing around with it. You know, they don't want any chance of losing that opportunity. So if we can make that real quick, that's only going to add value to everyone. But of course, there's, there's, there's a lot of blockers at, at the moment. And I think there always will be some blockers. We're getting there slowly. I think that we're trying to explore a bit more nowadays. As I've mentioned it a couple of times, that we are a lender in our own right now. Let's say yeah. on a very small scale. We're thinking, well, hold on. If we actually go out and become a, a bigger lender and yeah. we're taking more risk and doing more transactions ourselves, we don't have to worry about the lenders and all these other blockers. We mm -hmm. can create our own product that makes it much more quickly and much more quicker to, to do the transaction. So mm -hmm. that's the next stage for us is trying to get that investment in. There's various ways of doing that. But uh, that's got challenges as well, especially now we're, we're potentially hitting a recession. So there's going to be less companies in interested in investing. Yeah. And it'll be, I mean, maybe, maybe we should have another chat in two years time. Once you, once you tip the box and you, you're smashing it in that sense, uh, it'd be, be interesting to, to see what that journey has been like. So yeah, it's all the dating stuff, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah. It is yeah. Coming back to the pools project, the last question I'll ask on the pools. If you did it again, what would you do differently? What would I do differently? Uh, probably would have built it on a different platform. Platform that we built it on is, is restrictive to a certain degree. Or I think what happens of course, over time is that there's other platforms that come about that are easier to, uh, to code on, have more. Uh, Opportunities and to develop portals that are a bit more slicker, a bit more safe, a bit more secure. So, you know, hindsight is a wonderful thing, isn't it? I think mm. I would have done that. Also, we're doing a lot now of HubSpot. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we invested in HubSpot in the last couple of years, really only to do sort of our sales and marketing element of our business on anything transactional wise would go into our portal. I'm seeing opportunities now to have maybe develop sort of plugins, platforms that we could develop a help spot to actually achieve our end goal. So yeah. who knows, maybe we might go down the line this, at some point. So actually we might retire the traditional synergy platform, but yeah. create tools that sit on top of HubSpot and it would no change to our, to our users. They it wouldn't see any difference to be fair, but it would just be feeding all the information to HubSpot because I think it's a great platform. However. It's good for us, but you know, as, as a company grows, I, I can see it being not so great for us. Mm -hmm. So, you know, things like uh, SAP as well would be, be a good platform for us as well to, to explore mm -hmm. as well in the future, I think. Mm -hmm. Something that, you know, I, I know a bit about because obviously mm -hmm. we do have a lot of introducers like, uh, mm -hmm. like yourselves, but I haven't actually seen the functionality of it. And I'd love to see that because it might be mm -hmm. something we'd invest in down the line. So like I say, I think HubSpot has, has its. Uh, limitations and it will run out at some point. Whereas I understand that SAP and you can tell me uh, uh, more about this, it, it has a great platform to, to grow and it's continuously being developed and added to. And then there's also other apps as well that can be added to it as well, I suppose. That's it. And, and of course it depends what the end game is, right? You know, so, so, so when you developed your portal, you said, right, well, what What's in it for my customers? How can I help provide a better level of service? It's, it's exactly the same for any type of software project. So whenever people ask me about software systems, I always ask what's the end game. Yeah, because yeah, you're right. An end to end ERP system is often a good move if a company's grown and they want a single source of information, but timing is everything. You know, do you really want to upend the, the business on a software project that might take, you know, a decent chunk of your team out of out of their day to day for a bit whilst, whilst you're implementing, right? So, so timing is a big thing there. And as you mentioned, it's also the integration piece as well, because HubSpot is obviously best to breed for sales and marketing, you know, and it's all, it's always going to be updated and, and fit the purpose in that sense. So, you know, 
And and I've seen companies that integrate HubSpot with SAP. I've seen companies that integrate HubSpot with, with other solutions. So it, again, it depends on the departmental breakdown and what, what you want to see as a, as a business owner, which I suppose leads me on to my next question. So you've said that there's, you know, in theory could get to the point where the applications you've developed could integrate with something like HubSpot. The end game with that sort of thing is having more visibility, uh, I suppose the end-to-end picture, you know, so what we're seeing from our customers, what does that data look like? You know, what information we're getting from other areas of the business, how do we that tie that into a, a flashy dashboard on a snapshot it gives me all of the information that I need. I've been having more conversations recently about data storytelling and what is useful for business leaders. It'd be good to get your impression of, you know, place yourself in the future when you've got all of these systems talking to each other and, and everything's integrated. What information is important for you to decide, you know, how to navigate upcoming challenges or, or to make better business decisions? You know, when you speak to your finance team, when you speak to your ops team, when you speak to your sales team, what information are you looking for to make those strategic decisions? Yes, yeah, good, good question. I think the data that drives us is all about credit. It's as simple as that, really. Yeah. You know, we, we use credit safe to make our decisions. However, you know, we're, we're seeing some, some problems with that at the moment where we're finding other platforms that have a bit more data that we, we wish we knew at an earlier stage because we've had opportunities that we've lost or opportunities that we, we didn't get approved because we didn't have all the data that we needed. Yeah. I think we are living in a world now where it's all about the data. And I think as much as we could possibly get about a prospect, it helps us understand the market. So yeah. it's as simple as that, you know, it's, if we do, we're, we're lucky because we're on the, on the front line to a degree, so we can get a good gauge of what's happening in, in the economy. Now, but I do feel like we, we're, we're still a few weeks behind sometimes. It'd be great if we were right on that front line to understand exactly what's going on. So we yes. can gauge and the reason I want to gauge more about what's going on is because as we develop as a lender, we can create better products that are more suited to the economy or suited to an end user or even suited to an introducer. We can get that data. We can really sort of understand and reduce risk and provide value to, to the market. So I'm, I'm deadly keen about data and where we get it from. Fortunately, a lot of these people that provide the data, financial data, want, want to charge an, an arm and a leg for it. it. It's an interesting time at the minute. So they seem to be beating each other up to, to, for our services, yet they want to charge us an arm and a leg for them. So. Yeah. 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 It's, it... I suppose, and, and I don't want to put, put words in your mouth there, but di different, differentiation is something that I'm seeing a lot of businesses focus on at the moment. And, you know, you, you've heard, I'm sure the concept of niching down, right? You know, how, how do we provide the most possible value to the people that we can, we can serve? Yep. And, and that's why I say I don't want to put words in your mouth, but what I've got from that is that the more data you've got about the people that are dealing with day to day, the more you'll be able to carve out, you know, that, that ideal market that says the, these are some people who can really help, right? And you can, that's unfortunately, I say unfortunately, it's, it's part of what makes it exciting, but that's what then comes down to you can, that process of continuous improvement, isn't it? You know, more data over time leads to, to more accuracy. So thanks for that. I appreciate, appreciate I think also as well to add to that as well is that, uh, there's segments that we find of the industry that aren't being serviced very well from the lenders. And, you know, I, I was thinking about one the other day, tell for instance, we know well, the high streets going backwards you can visually see that it's been happening over the last sort of 10 years or so. Certainly, uh, of stores in the retail sector that are niche are doing very well. Mm. Now, if you go to a lender in your retail uh, store or chain of retail store, the likelihood is they will decline just mm. because you're in retail. Yeah. Now there's plenty of retail stores out doing very, very well. And we had a company uh, come to us only a, a month or so ago who spent half a million pounds on an EPOS solution. They had known been around since the eighties in stores across uh, the UK and Ireland. And, uh, we're in a really niche sector and, you know, part of what they, they sold was close to my heart, my son's heart, you know, we, we're into sort of novels and you know uh all the uh, paraphernalia around that you know so 
they were doing very well, very well. They had a very poor year during COVID, but who didn't? And mm. they recovered to, to, to a being status better than the, the year prior to COVID. But we had absolutely huge amount of trouble trying to get the, the funding for them. In fact, mm. we did a large chunk of it ourselves at the end because I knew that it'd be absolutely fine. Yeah. So it's those kind of things. The data can, can give you some elements of a, of a sector where you can, so actually you can't just say that that whole sector is rubbish and it's all going to fail because actually there's elements of it. It's going to do very, very well. So with an update, we can deal with those niches within the industries that, and, and know that there's, there's much fewer risk involved. Yeah. And then you've got, I, with the businesses that I work, I, I tend to find that there's two chains of thoughts when it comes to niching down. So there's some businesses that think we don't want to limit our market. We want to sell to everyone and anyone. Yeah. Marketing thrown all over the place, particularly throwing stuff at the wall until it sticks. Yeah. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, you know, especially if you've got the marketing budget, you know, especially if you financed your software project. So that now I've got more market. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. But then there's, there's the side which we're talking about there that says, is it to be like known as the experts in a certain space rather than trying to be everything to everyone? Because you, you know, from that then that it gives you a competitive advantage if you're able to provide a service to people that others won't provide a service to. Then when you have further conversations in the future, you've got that referenceability and that credibility to say, look, you know, th this is what we've done before. And it all starts with the data, doesn't it? You know, you, you yeah. can't make the decisions on what works and what doesn't work unless you've got the data. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. That's... Absolutely. I think, you know, it is all about niching to me. You know, I, yes, we've got a niche and you know us as technology provider, technology finance provider. Great. There's up, there's three, two other elements to our business as well. Mm. I mean, we have, we have a property division, we have a cash flow division as well. So what happens is that we go out with our niche. My customers come on board and they go back to them and say, well, what else do you need? You know, it can be from any different sectors. It could be, I don't know, a warehouse or whatever it is, hauliers, logistics, whatever it may be. And they will say, well, actually I'm going to invest in a new vehicle. Okay. Well, we can fund that for you. Well, actually I've got a bit of a hole in my cash flow because I've got customers now who are not paying me on time. They're paying me in 90 days, or we can provide a revolving credit facility or an invoice finance facility. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we use the niche then provide other services as well. So we start plugging those gaps, those customers, those customers, you know, who enjoyed us the experience with the initial transaction will then enjoy the experience they have with us with all the other products. And they tend to stay our customers for a long period of time. We can service them ongoing because I've worked with brokerages and other finance companies in the past where you just do one product, hmm. one product, and that's it. And once the customer comes back to you, you've got a relationship and they say, well, could you do this? And you can just say, no, I mean, you, then you're pointing that customer to a competitor and then they may never come back ever again. So yeah. I think yeah. it's important to be able to plug those gaps, but also go out, put your stall out as a niche. And um, yeah. because otherwise, you know, you, you can't be everything to everyone. Yeah. yeah. And then link, as you said, we're, we're moving from differentiation there to diversification. Yeah. Yeah. Which, which again is, is a really great use case for having lots of data. Because as you say, the more data you've got, the more, more gaps you'll be able to fill. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, wider examples, you know, is it the right time for us to open a new office run or a new store? You know, are we getting a load of business in a region that would actually be good if we had some, some face-to-face -face representation there? You know, that's, that's one example. Your example of cross, cross platform products and another example there, not, not physically, but obviously with the services that you provide there. And then wider than that, you know, we're smashing it in the UK, you know, U S market might be pretty good. You know, is it worth repeating that? Is it possible to repeat that? And again, it comes back to the data, doesn't it? So yes. Yeah. Exactly. Kind of good. No, I appreciate that. That was really, really good. So one, one of the last questions that I tend to ask, I'll, I'll, I'll let you go to it. We're coming up, to, co coming up to time is because this podcast is called tech for finance. I, always ask what is the one or piece of software or gadget that you, you just couldn't live without. And I appreciate it. I'll put you on the spot because I didn't send these questions over, but off the top of your head, what app 
software or gadget could you not live without? Well, the, the, the sad thing is I've got slightly addicted to TikTok recently. <laughs> and, and I know, I know, I'm, I'm a 44-year-old man. The fact is I'm really into to cooking as well. I, I, I love creating stuff in the kitchen. So I tend to have it. Most of my TikTok videos I'm looking are all towards cooking, that kind of stuff. And I love those little bits of information real quick, like, you know, education. I'm always about, it's got to add value to me. If I'm going to consume anything, it's got to add value to me really quick. So I'm, I'm finding I do get lost in a bit of a TikTok hole when it comes to cookery uh, programs, that kind of stuff. That, that's quite cool. But I have done one, which I'm, which I'm loving, it's called Headway. Basically gives you information. Uh, you can go on there and tell them what kind of you're interested in. We'll recommend little books. Tend to be very bite-sized little books or poems or entertainment uh, or something like this that gear towards what you want to try to achieve in your life and your business or whatever it may be. And I love it because it also just messages you say, you, you haven't logged in today. You need to complete reading this little book. And it might be, you know, they might do a shrunken down version of the habits of the highly effective people, whatever it may be called. I like it. It's a great app. It's a little bit pricey. I think it's like 60 quid a year. I mean, it does enable you to focus your mind on little things that will add value to your life every day. And I think if you use it every day, which I don't, I'll probably use it every other day, every yeah. three days, whatever it may be, it does keep my thoughts and, and, and systems of processes in my mind, you know, uh, so I would really recommend that one. I have heard of it. I think it's come up in my Instagram feed a couple of times. So I think, yeah. I think I clicked through, but I didn't, I didn't go ahead with it. So I used, um, slightly different. There's a, there's a app called Blinkist, which oh, yeah. is booked only. So it'll do book summaries. So, so book summaries, you can either read or listen to in 15 minutes. I think it is. But it seems like Headway is going a step further and saying it's not just books, it's other useful tidbits as well that you could. Yeah. yeah so I'll, I'll definitely check it out off the back of your recommendation. That's fabulous. Which, uh, which is an advert on TikTok. So I've got proper stuff. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> wow. You know, I've, I've never, um, never downloaded or gone onto TikTok ever. Yeah. I can understand why. I think it's got a bad name. I mean, if you use it in the way you want to use it, then I think it's really good medium to, to, to gather information. Yeah. Uh, so something TikTok links, but obviously I understand the concept. It's what well, it's, it's short videos, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. I think it is the way the market's going as well. I think YouTube did it recently. YouTube have now uh, introduced something called YouTube shorts. I don't know whether you've heard of those, but I think they're, yeah. they're trying to, to, to tackle the TikTok piece because attention spans are getting shorter, which is why TikTok's done so well, because it's entertaining and it's in seconds. So YouTube have introduced the concept of shorts. Interesting to see where, where that goes. I often wonder how, how, sh how short can a video get? I mean, I think the stats say that our attention spans are now less than golf or something like that. So yeah, be interesting to see where that market goes. Now, I don't, yeah, still a bit reluctant on TikTok, but I like my food as well, so I might, I might give it a go off the back of the recommendation. Head, headway, definitely. Thanks for the recommendation on that. And for people listening, that is get-headway.com is how you'll find that. Or if you just um, headway app into your search engine of choice, I think. Thanks, brother. So lastly, then, do you want to tell people a bit more about how, how people how they can find you and how they can find Synergy. I was going to drill a little bit deeper earlier on, but I think we were, we were having a good conversation. So that's so I didn't mention it, but of course our last conversation talked around the 130% tax rebate. So, so for anybody that's listening, cause it's only, it's only available up until March, isn't it? March next year. Correct. Yeah, that's fine. So, like so for anybody, that, yeah, anybody who's listening and correct if I'm wrong, Rob, but for technology projects, specifically te technology projects, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, you can claim 130% of the amount that hits your balance sheets and then um, like 19% back or something like that. T take us through yeah. it. So I'll take a hash of it. No, no, that's fine. Well, let's, let's keep numbers simple. Let, let's say there was a hundred thousand pound project. 
Now, um, simple math is, is, is a hundred thousand pounds times by 130% gives you 130,000 pounds. And the corporation tax rate is currently 19%. So, uh, and of 130,000 pounds will be 24,700 pounds in tax relief. So another simple term is that if at the end of the year, corporation tax bill is a hundred grand, but you'd, uh, to the hundred grand's worth of it, uh, 24,700 pounds off the corporation tax bill. And that's available up until the end of March next year. Yeah, and the only way you can really sort of grab that is if, if the asset that you're, or the investment, the project hits your balance sheet. And uh, various ways of doing that is yes, you can pay cash, or if you borrowed the money, loan basis, that means obviously it's very similar to paying cash, so therefore you, you own it straight away. Mm -hmm. You sometimes can do it on lease purchase agreements. Not all lenders like financing IT on lease purchase because of all the property rights that are involved in software. They can't take ownership of them so they're all they can't really finance them you can sort of do it on a lease as well there's some jiggery poker you can do of a lease to make sure that the customer get ownership at the back end of the agreement and some accountants would argue that that's not the correct way some would say well that's a way of getting around things so it all comes down to your account at the end of the day if your mm -hmm. accountant's happy with it hit the balance sheet then you can get 130 percent if they're not then fair enough i'm, I'm sure there's other ways that we can do it so, as I say, end of March, as the beginning of April, corporation tax rate goes up to 25%, which is a bit of a shocker. And of course, the, um, the ops, the 130% will disappear. So we may find companies deciding to lease rather than loan or pay cash for IT pro projects, because every repayment on a lease is hundred percent tax allowable. So that means that they can reduce their corporation tax bill even more with a 25% increase, sorry, the increase to 25%. Yeah. Uh, there may be a switch of people's desires, how to fund things either way we've got. Okay. Fine. Fabulous. And for people listening into, into the future, that's March, 2023. Uh, okay. we're, we're in November, 2022 now. So just for anybody that's listening in the future, hopefully they will. <laughs> so. How can people find you, Rob? So it's synergy with an I, isn't it? Synergy with an I, uh, dot synergy, uh, S Y N E R G I hyphen finance.co.uk. You can contact, uh, directly at Rob synergy hyphen finance.co.uk. Pick up the phone. O triple three, two, four, two, double three, double one. Get our website. There's a, there's a form on there. You can fill out for us. Touch. That's fine. And you're on, you're on LinkedIn as well, aren't you? You're up. Yeah. Quite active on there. So happy to, to DM me. Yeah. It's just, yeah. Rob Partridge on LinkedIn is, uh, hard to find you there. Perfect. All right, Rob. Fabulous. Thanks for coming on. No, great. Enjoyed it, Adam. Thanks very much. Yeah. We'll, we'll catch up soon. I'm sure. But uh, yeah, I no, really appreciate the time. Great. Thanks. Take care. Cheers. Later. Cheers.